Well, buenos dias, amigos y iglesia familia. And now I have to say it this way. Welcome to all of you joining us online, because I have no idea how to say that in Spanish, because you just saw the extent of my Spanish right there. Um, it's been great being in the Dominican the last two weeks. I can just proclaim to you that our team was amazing. The group of teens and adults that went did an amazing job, and I just want to tell you, God continues to move all over the world, and He is on the move in the Dominican Republic like never before. People are giving their lives to Christ like crazy in the Dominican. People are following Him in discipleship like crazy in the Dominican, and churches are being planted like crazy all over the east side of the Dominican Republic because of what you do here at Rock Creek. It's rippling all the way to there. And so thank you so much for being involved. If you've never been on a mission trip, I can't tell you any more emphatically that you've got to go because it will change your life when you see the real world, not the bubble we live in. When you see what God's doing all over the world, it will change you. And so we want to encourage you, if you have a chance to go, go on a missions trip. You say, I don't know the language. It's okay. We have translators everywhere that will help you with the language, okay? My dad and mom went with us on this trip this time. The first time my parents have been to the Dominican, and my dad all week was asking them where the banjo was. Where's your banjo? And I'm like, Dad, it's not banjo, it's banjo. Well, it's a J. I'm like, yeah, it's Jan, yeah. So, so, hey, we figured it out. He figured it out, right? So we'd love for you to go on a trip with us sometime soon. So glad to be back. Glad to be back with our Rock Creek family and continue in our series, Skeptic. And let me just proclaim to you, Pastor Greg has done an amazing job the last two weekends kicking this series off, and he's done a great job. We have such a great team here, and I love what God's doing here. This is not a church. This is a movement of God, and I'm so thrilled to be able to continue week three in this series. Let me just tell you why we're doing this, because we're doing four weeks called Skeptic leading into Easter weekend, because our theme of Easter weekend this year is Believe. And so what we want you to do is move beyond the skepticism maybe that's in your own life, because all of us are skeptics at one time or another. Right now, some of you walked in here today, and you're skeptic. You're, you're skeptical of Jesus. You're skeptical of Rock Creek. You're not real sure about this. Listen, step into belief. Move beyond skepticism and trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but, but in all your ways, press into him, and he will make your path straight. And so we're asking you to step in out of skepticism into belief. And here's where we're going to land on, on Easter weekend. We're going to land with probably a guy who was really, really probably the most skeptical of all the disciples, and his name was Thomas. If anybody had doubts about Jesus, it was Thomas. In fact, his nickname was Doubting Thomas. But on the other side of the resurrection, when he sees the nail prints in Jesus' hands, and when he sees the nail print in his feet, and he sees the wound in Jesus' side, Thomas then believes. And Jesus says this to Thomas in that moment. You have seen, and that's why you believe. But blessed are those who have yet to see and still believe. And that's you and me. And so I want to encourage you to bring somebody with you on Easter weekend that is skeptical of Jesus because we're going to preach the gospel to them and we're going to encourage them to step in to belief. Week one, Pastor Greg talked about what is truth. Week two, last week, he basically just blew up this idea that God couldn't use us. God wants to use us for his kingdom and his glory. Today, we're going to go into a character study and we're going to be in the book of John. And we're going to be in chapter 3 of the book of John. And as soon as I say John 3, some of you that know your Bible know that we're going to talk about the poster child of all skeptics in the New Testament. His name is Nicodemus. And this guy is skeptical about who Jesus is, and he wants to know more about Jesus. And maybe just like you today, you've walked in here and you're a little skeptical, but maybe you just want to know a little bit more about Jesus. And Jesus is going to expose everything today. He's going to expose the truth to you, and the truth will set you free if you'll step into that truth. Nicodemus is a poster child for skepticism. And out of this story, we're going to see John 3, 16, which is the most famous verse in all of the Bible, is it not? Like, like everybody knows John 3, 16. And last night, I preached on March 16, 3, 16. But today is 3, 17, and it's a green day. Come on. And I wore my green, and some of you wore your green. And some of you didn't remember to wear your green. It's okay. You can still go to heaven. It'll be fine, all right? But here's the cool thing. Today is 317, and what I'm going to show you today is verse 17 is just as important as verse 16. Because verse 17 is the gospel in its purest form, following up for God so loved the world. And we're going to press into this. And I'm hoping what will happen today is a familiar verse that you've let become unfamiliar will be fresh and new for you today when you see the context of everything 
around this verse, the actual conversation that was going on. Maybe, just maybe you're like me and you've turned on an NFL game and you've seen something like this on your TV. Like between the goalposts, somebody, rainbow-haired, crazy man is holding up a sign, right? John 3.16. Or maybe you're like me, you love Major League Baseball, and maybe it was when the Tigers and the Giants played in the World Series and somebody held that up behind home plate. And if you love to watch baseball, you recognize the guy standing next to that sign as the Marlins man who always finds his way behind home plate on the big games. Guy must be just rich, right? Or maybe you've been to this place for a burger and on the bottom of your cup you saw this. Which, by the way, I'm from Texas and I'm just going to proclaim it. Whataburger's better. I love my California brothers and sisters, but what Whataburger's better. But if you want to take me to in and out I will never, ever turn down a burger and fries. Never. I don't care where it is. I'll eat McDonald's with you. It doesn't matter. But, but, but maybe you've had a cup like that. Or, or maybe you've seen it this way. The, the original kneeler in the NFL wore it under his eye black, Tim Tebow. Remember, he was the first one that took a knee and prayed to God in the end zone. And he wore it under his eye black when he was at the University of Florida, the Gators. Come on. Maybe you've seen it that way. What you probably don't understand in relation to the verse is there's a whole context of a conversation going on between two people. The God-man Jesus and this religious leader named Nicodemus. Let's pick it up in verse 1. And as we press in today to verse 1, here's what I want you to get today. Write this down. Doubt does not disqualify you. Your doubts do not disqualify. Here's why I know that. Because chances are you've had doubts or having doubts or someday you will have doubts. I've had a lot of doubts over the last two weeks. Because I've been riding in a van with our missionary pastor down there in the Dominican in that traffic. And I've had a lot of doubts over the last two weeks. Jesus, just get me home. Take the wheel, Jesus. Right? But listen, your doubts don't disqualify you. Your doubts are actually a setup for a conversation that could lead to complete spiritual transformation in your life. If you'll press into your doubts and get the answers that you seek. And that's what we're going to see. Let's pick it up in verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. This is our skeptic. Who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So that means he knows the law. He's a Pharisee. He has studied the Torah. Chances are he has the entire Old Testament memorized. He's religious. He's educated. But even in his religion and his education, he's smart enough to know that there's something missing in his life. There's a a God-shaped hole in the center of every human's heart that only Jesus can fill. And Nicodemus realizes, I know everything about God, but I don't know God. And this Jesus that has come on the scene, he speaks like no one else I've ever heard speak. And I've seen things that I've never seen before that he's done, and I want to know more. Verse 2, it says, he came to Jesus at night. Now, if you have a paper Bible today and you like to write or draw in your, in your Bible, if you have a paper Bible, underline the two words at night. We'll get to that in a minute. When he came to Jesus at night, he said, Rabbi. Now, that's what they would have called a Jewish teacher, Rabbi. And then look at the next word, we. Underline that word as well. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Let me just say something right there. I just want to say, I haven't said this in any of the other services, but it just hit me as I read that. A lot of people say, Pastor, can you explain to me what God is doing at Rock Creek? Absolutely not. It's unexplainable because God is doing it. We are not. And so when God does things that are supernatural and people's lives are changed supernaturally, it's not the work of mankind. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so there are things going on here that I can't explain, but I'm just on the ride, and I'm just pressing into it. God, just take the wheel and lead us through what you're doing. I'm with you. God, you're blowing. Your wind is blowing. I'm going to raise my sail, and I'm going to go with where you're blowing. And so God is doing some great things here, but God was doing some great things in Nicodemus' life, and he realizes it. And notice he says, Rabbi, we know. Now, Now, notice he doesn't say, Rabbi, I know. Did you catch that? He's speaking in the plural here, not the singular, which tells me this. Come on, write this down. Skeptics love company. Like like skeptics want to find, no one wants to go to a party alone and no one wants to be a skeptic alone. They want to get a bunch of people to be skeptical with them. And even at times at Rock Creek that has happened. People have been skeptical and they try to press their skepticism into other people about what God is doing. Listen, don't let the enemy do that to you. Listen, don't, don't let the enemy 
fall prey or you fall prey to the enemy in this idea of skepticism or those that are skeptical. Here's what I'm telling you. Nicodemus isn't just going for Nicodemus. Nicodemus is being sent by all the Pharisees to go talk to Jesus. Like they don't want to go, but Nicodemus, you go for us. Because they were all skeptics of who Jesus said. Listen, you know why they crucified Jesus? It wasn't because what he did, it's because he who he said he was. And they're skeptical of that because he's not fitting the mold. He didn't overthrow Rome. And so they want to know some things about him. But they stay in the shadows of darkness and they send Nicodemus at night. Verse 3 says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Basically, Nick, you don't know anything that you think you know. You know so much, you don't really truly know the essence of what God is doing in and through me. And if you want to see the kingdom of God, Nick, you got to be born again. Now, now you have to understand, there's so much in those two words, born again. Say them with me. One, two, three. Born again. One more time. Born again. There is so much loaded in those two words. First one is this. See, Nicodemus thinks because he's a Jewish man that he has a first-class ticket to heaven. He thinks because he is of the nation of Israel that he is a Jew, that somehow, some way, racially, he's going to get into heaven. But how many of you know when Jesus came to the earth, he tore down every racial and gender barrier? You understand, every one of us bleed red. Come on. Every one of us. And so God sees the heart of the man. And so what Jesus is doing in this moment is he's breaking down a racial barrier in Nicodemus' life. He's saying, Nicodemus, I know you're a Jew. I know you're a Pharisee. I know you know the entire Torah. But you've got to be born again. Now, now, Nicodemus understands this word born, but he doesn't quite understand the word again. Like, like in my house right now, this word born is a big deal. Like we're talking about being born a lot in my house because we got, we got a grandbaby coming in June that's going to be born. Little Maggie's going to be born in June. And listen, I'm not real happy with my kids right now because they should have planned better because they're disrupting my summer vacation. I'm like, you should have planned better because we always go to the Dominican for July, right? But not this year. No, we're going to Mississippi in July, are we not? <laughs> Sarah's going to make sure we're there, right? But this idea of being born, we all understand this idea of being born. But being born again is a different concept to Nicodemus. Listen, Nicodemus is about to learn being a Jewish man is not enough. And listen, being a Greek for that matter is not enough either. And for you and for me, our mom's faith can't get us into the kingdom of God. Your dad's faith can't get you into the kingdom of God. And your grandfather could have been a deacon at every First Baptist Church of every town in Texas, and it won't get you into heaven because their faith is their faith. Your faith has to be your faith. You have to be born again. And we all understand being born because, hey, listen, every one of you were born. Everybody have a mom? Yeah, yeah, that's everybody. And if you don't, we can talk later. But, but, but listen, this word again is what's throwing Nicodemus off because the Greek word for again is anthonin. And that word in the Greek means to be born from above. See, see the theological word that we would use there is regeneration. And so what, what, what Jesus is telling Nick is, Nick, it's not enough to be born physically. You've got to be born spiritually. And Nick is so confused in this moment because, because he, he, he's thinking about the fact that knowing the Old Testament, God, God can make him better. But Jesus didn't come to make anybody better. God, God sent Jesus to make us new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past, behold, the new has come. So Jesus didn't come to make Nick better. He came to make Nick new. Verse 4, look at this. Nicodemus, he's lost in this moment. He says, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb. Again, he's thinking born. Jesus is thinking again. He's thinking physical. Jesus is thinking spiritual. And then we get to verse 5. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you. Now let's stop right there and unpack that phrase because I want you to understand, Jesus didn't say very truly I tell you because he was lying to him before that. Jesus doesn't have to say, hey, I was fibbing to you here, so now I'm going to tell you the truth. When Jesus says, very truly I tell you, Jesus is saying, put down your cell phone, look at me in the eyes and pay attention. Because I'm about to drop a truth bomb on you that can change your life. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Now let's unpack those two words, water and spirit. Because there's a lot of confusion about what Jesus is saying in this moment. But when we get to verse 6, Jesus is going to prove to us what he's saying. But not yet. Let me unpack it, and then I'll read verse 6 for you. Jesus says you have to be born of water and spirit. 
A lot of people have taken that to believe that it's not enough to say yes to Jesus. Your salvation is not complete until you're dunked in the water tank over here like we did 76 people a few weeks ago. That that seals your salvation because Jesus said you have to be born of water and spirit. And you can't get to heaven unless you're baptized. Let me ask you a question. If that's theologically correct, then what do you do with the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. Now let's get down off the cross and let's go get baptized. No, no, baptism is an outward commitment uh, or an outward sign of an inward commitment that's already been made in your life. It's your first step of obedience. It's identifying with Christ in public that your faith is with Jesus. And the water comes out of the janitor's closet, folks. It's Texas tap water. Listen, here's what Jesus is saying in this moment, and verse 6 is going to prove it to us. Every one of you that were born were born in a water sack called a placenta. And so what Jesus is saying when he says you have to be born of water, he's talking about your physical birth. But then you have to be reborn again spiritually. Look what verse 6 says. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. See the correlation with chapter five, or verse 5 and verse 6? You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. See, the wind blows Nicodemus wherever it pleases. Like, like the wind blows wherever it wants to blow. And sometimes in Texas, like on Thursday, it blows really hard. Yeah, only to come home from the Dominican with a bunch of dents in my car. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone that's born of the Spirit. Let me unpack that for a minute. Only you know when you were born again. That's your decision, and I can't tell you, only you know, that you know, that you know, that you know that when God calls your name and says, come home, that you're going to heaven for eternity because you have been born again. But what I do know is I see the results of the fruit of your life of the decision you've made for Christ. And so what I'm telling you is the wind blows, and I can't see the wind. I see the effects of the wind. And that's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Nicodemus, it's not about religious practices. No one can ever identify that as regeneration. It's about being born again. And I'm not going to be able to tell you where the wind comes from, or you're not going to be able to see where it's going, but you're going to know it when it happens. It's because it's supernatural. And then Nick says in verse 9, how can this be? How can this be? And look at verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Now, I love when I read Scripture. I love when I read sarcastic Jesus. <laughs> I love this. Cause, cause I, and, 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 you know, there's a lot of debate about the chosen. I love the chosen. I love it. And if you got a problem with that, you can send the email to God. But, but, but I love to watch the chosen. And here's why. Because they wrap humanity around deity. And Jesus was all man, and yet he was all God, and he was all God, and yet he was all man at the same time. And so he would have conversations with people, and every once in a while, Jesus gets a little sarcastic. And in this moment, he's being sarcastic with Nick. He's like, Nick, 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 you're so smart that you're ignorant. You know so much, and yet you don't know anything. Like, like, like Nick, you're like my teenager. You think you know everything. Oh, but you don't know nothing yet. Now, Jesus isn't saying that because he didn't have a kid. I'm saying that. Nick, you're a lot like my kids were when they thought they knew everything, and now that they're about to be parents themselves, they realize, wow, we didn't know anything. And then Jesus continues to have a conversation with him about some Old Testament things. And then he gets to verse 16. For God so loved the world. Now, now stay with me here because when you read that and I read that, we think, oh, yes, God loves the world. We are the world. We are the children. God loves all the world, and he does love all the world. But what he is saying to Nicodemus in this moment is, Nicodemus, God loves the entire world, not just Israel. God loves every single person on planet Earth. Can I bring it home a little bit more? God loves the kid in row 20, seat C, when you're sitting in row 19, seat C, in a five-hour flight from the Dominican back to the United States. <laughs> that kid who was letting me know he was behind me for five hours, and I was about to cast the demon out of the child, <laughs> only to turn and see his father in the middle seat, who was about 6'6". Six, six. I just took it. 
in that moment, I realized God loves that kid, even though I don't right now. <laughs> For God so loved the world. Nick, Nick, God loves the entire world, not just Israel. How about this? God loves the cray-cray world that you and I are living in right now. All this stuff that you and I are like, I cannot believe it. God's not shocked. You know why? Because it's been going like this since Genesis 3. And that's why God sent Christ into the world. We're going to see that. Continue on. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. His love for the world led him to do something about the world's sin issue. And that whoever believes in him, whoever, whoever, right? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 31,102 verses in the Bible, and that's probably the most famous one. And most people never get to verse 17. But look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. He sent Jesus into the world to save the world through him. Listen to me. Some of you are skeptical today because you think if you step into God's love through Christ that the hammer is going to fall on your life. Listen to me. Everybody look right here. The hammer did fall. It drove three nails into the body of Christ. And you have a choice to make. You either pay for your sin or you'll let Jesus pay for it. He didn't send Christ to the world to condemn us. He sent Christ into the world to save us through him. That's the gospel. That's the good news that, that when you couldn't get to God, when you couldn't do enough good things to get to God, God in his love and his mercy and grace came to you. See, this is so important for Nicodemus to understand because Nicodemus is trying to dot I's and cross T's, and so are some of you. But Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, verse 18, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now look at verse 19, 20, and 21. This reads like the headlines of foxnews.com. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Did you know there is actually a, pho a phobia called photophobia? It's the fear of not having your picture made. Photophobia is the fear of light. And we live in a world where people have photophobia because they're afraid that the light will expose everything in their life. Verse 21, but whosoever or whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Step into the light, Nick. Come out of the darkness. Step into the light that doesn't condemn you but comes to save you. See, Nicodemus is a skeptic. And here's what I know about Nicodemus today. He not only went to represent himself, he not only went to represent the religious leaders that he was a part of, I think Nicodemus represents all of us today. Because all of us have been skeptics from one time or another. And here's what I know about skeptics. Here's four applications from this passage today. Skeptics tend to hang out under the cover of darkness. Uh, did you notice when Nick came? It says he came to Jesus at night. He's the original Nick at night. <laughs> Worked all week on that. Yeah. He comes under the cover of darkness. Now, a lot of people would say, some theologians say, some commentaries say, he came at night because he knew that Jesus would, would be free to have an uninterrupted conversation with him at night because during the daytime hours, Jesus was surrounded by people. Could be. I think Nicodemus comes at night because he doesn't want to be exposed. I think he comes at night because he's a distant follower of Jesus, and he's just afraid that if he comes during the daytime, someone might, someone might identify him as a potential follower of Jesus, and, and he didn't want to be seen. I also think that he comes at night because skeptics like to hang out in the darkness rather than in the light. And so I think for Nicodemus, Nicodemus is like a lot of people in the church world today. Nick's got one foot in the light, and he's got one foot in the darkness, and he can't choose which way he wants to go. 
See, he likes the darkness sometimes. And other times he wants to be in the light. But he's interested enough to come to Jesus. That's what I want to tell you today. If you've been hanging out in the darkness, at least he came to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Even if it's in the cover of darkness, come to Jesus. But here's what I know about skeptics. They love to hang out in the darkness, and they love to have company in the darkness. The second thing that Nicodemus is going to learn, and the second thing that we need to learn, is religious information often stands in the way of a relational transformation. See, see, Nick knows everything, and I think knowing everything, I think knowing everything in the Torah, and I think knowing the Old Testament by heart, and being a studier of the law, I think his knowledge is getting the way of the trust of faith. You see, see, some of you right now, you're skeptics because you have to have all the information. And if you, if you know everything about God, then you are going to be God. And if you haven't been told this yet, you're not God. And how many of you want to worship a God that you know everything about? I want some mystery to my God. I, the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. There are just some answers I'm not going to have, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to believe in an empty tomb three days later. And I'm going to step into that light, the light that is coming to the world, even though I don't have all the answers. And I've had people tell me, well, Pastor, someday when I get to heaven, I'm going to get all the answers to my questions. You're not going to have any questions in heaven because you're going to be in the presence of the answer to all of them. Why not step into it today? It requires trust. It requires faith to move beyond a head knowledge into a heart relationship. A lot of people are going to miss eternity in heaven by 18 inches. The distance between their heart and their brain. Let, let, me, let me unpack this for you. Let me bring it down to where we might understand it. So, so Friday, 20 of us, 20 of us board an airplane in the Dominican Republic. An airplane made by Boeing. A 737 Max, okay? And we all got on board, just like we do these stupid roller coasters that just turn us inside out. Oh, let's do that. That looks like fun. We got on the plane. When I get on the plane, I, I, it doesn't matter if I'm flying like an Airbus or a Boeing. I don't care. I touch the outside of that plane and I say a prayer. How many of you do that? Oh, dear Lord, get me home. And I'm checking on bolts, you know, making sure the door is secure. <laughs> but I get on the plane, and I always look to the left to see who's in the, in the flight deck, right? Because uh, if you're flying American, I want to see if Ken Evans is up there, one of our church members that flies for American. And if I'm flying Southwest, I want to see if Kendall McGee's up there because I would know those guys, right? And if I know the pilot, it's going to make things a lot better. But the problem with this flight to that day is, is the door was kind of halfway open, and I couldn't see who was in there. So I had no idea who the pilot or the co-pilot was. No idea. But here's what I do know. When I sit down in 19C, I put my seatbelt on, and I put my full faith and trust in them that they were going to get me to DFW. And I've never met them, never talked to them. Only time I ever heard them was on an intercom system that sounded like this. I'm like, we can send a man to the moon. Maybe. Maybe. That is a sermon for another day. And they can't fix an intercom system where you, how many of you love to hear your captain talk to you? Like, like when, the, when the back of the plane is bouncing because you're going over the storm that passed through Dallas on Thursday, I want him to tell me it's going to be okay. Talk to me. But here's what I know. He got me home. We landed safely. And I put my entire faith and trust and somebody I did not know. Here's what you need to understand today. All of you are trusting in someone or something every day. And you, you don't have the answers to that something or someone every day. And yet you're requiring that. Oh, i got to have all the answers. Listen, even an atheist is praying when the plane's going down. <laughs> Come on. Don't let all the information block you from a heart relationship. Because as a skeptic, here's what you got to go back to. Here's how you move out of skepticism. You got to go back to your childlike faith versus your childish faith. Do you remember what Jesus said that we had to be like to come to him? Like little children. Now, he wasn't saying that you have to act like a child, he was saying you have to have the heart of the innocence of a child. We have to come to Christ. Do you remember, do you, do you remember when you maybe said yes to Jesus when you were a child? I was 12 years old. I was a sixth grade boy. 
obnoxious. If you've got a sixth grade boy right now that won't shut up, you have a candidate for a pastor. (laughs) I was that kid. Often had strange smells. Always talking. But I had a Sunday school teacher named Joanne Calme who loved me because Jesus loved me. And she would show me in the Bible how Jesus gave his life for me. And, and she, she took me by the hand one Sunday and took me to my pastor. My pastor sat down on the back row of that little auditorium on a pew, on a wooden pew. And he opened up the book of Romans and he showed me how I could say yes to Jesus and give my life to Christ. And as a 12-year-old boy, I prayed a prayer and I said yes to Jesus. And I've been on my way to heaven ever since. But let me just tell you, something between 12 and 54, there's a little baggage that happens. The tires lose a little tread. And what happens with all of that baggage is I lose the innocence of that moment when I was 12. And here's what I want to tell you today. If you're a skeptic and you've said yes to Jesus and you're doubting it right now, listen, go back to your first love. Go back to that moment when you were just like a child. Step back into a childlike faith. Not a childish faith, but a childlike faith. And if you've never said yes to Jesus today and you're skeptic of Jesus, listen, Jesus says you've got to be of the innocence of a heart of a child when you come to him. Which leads us to the last thing today. And it's this, Jesus is light, and you can't have him any other way. He's light. And here's what's going to happen. When you come like a, I listen, again, I'm not saying don't study the word of God. I'm not saying don't study God. I'm not saying don't become a devoted follower. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying as you do those things, don't lose that childlike innocence. But as you step into this idea of the light, some of you right now are scared of that because you know light exposes you know that if, if you're exposed fully, then you might receive shame and guilt. And here's what I want to tell you about Rock Creek Church. If you step into the light right here, you do not receive shame and guilt. You receive love and forgiveness. That's what's different about this place. We're so much about what we're for rather than what we're against. So many people have mistaken the word born again to born against. That'll preach. You weren't born against, you were born again. And so if you step into the light, yes, light is going to expose some things. Light is going to reveal some things. You're going to see some things about you that don't look like God. You know why? Because you're not God, but Jesus can make you right in God's eyes. He can make you the righteousness of God. He can restore that broken relationship between you and your holy creator. Step into the light. Don't fear the light. Oh, you know, Pastor, I got, I got a lot of baggage. Well, so do I. If you want to know, ask her. She can tell you every day, I got to step re- back into the light. Really? Yes. Welcome to the human race. Every single one of you have got something right now. There's a shame or a guilt right now buried deep in your heart. Deep. And you think if you step into the light, it's going to hurt. Listen. If you surrender to Jesus, let me help you today. So many of you are afraid to surrender everything to Jesus because you think the moment you surrender, you lose. But the last time I checked, when you surrender, you join the winning team. Surrendering is moving from losing to winning. And so step into the light. Here's what you need. He already knows. (laughs) He already knows. Let me help you today. This is religion. Here it is. I messed up and my daddy's going to kill me. Here's the gospel. I messed up. And my father came to help me. But he can only help you if you'll step into the light. If you'll take on the heart of a child. Not be childish, but childlike. Move beyond everything you're trying to figure out here and open up your heart here. Move beyond skepticism. Move move out of the shadow of darkness. Move beyond the friends that want to keep pulling you back into the darkness. Sometimes to step into the light, it means you've got to step out of the darkness too and remove yourself from people who keep pulling you back. 
And a lot of times people will pull you back into the darkness because they don't want you to get freedom because if you get freedom now, they're going to know they could get freedom. See, a lot of people don't want you to get healed. And at the same time, a lot of people don't want to be healed because if they get healed in the light, well, then they lose their excuse and their attention they're getting from being broken. Oh. Well, if I stay broken, everybody, I can still be a victim. No, I don't want to be a victim. I want to be a victor. And I'm a victor in Christ. Not in my own, Billy, but in Christ. Step into the light. Step out of photophobia. Step into the light. Will you bow your heads with me? In this moment, I want to, I want to pray two things today. I want to, I want to give you two opportunities. And, and, and one is for those of you who have skepticism about Jesus and you've never said yes. And then the other is for those of you who have said yes. Right now, you're dealing with some doubts. I just want to tell you, skepticism is a moral dilemma of unbelief. For some of you today, you need to stop doubting in a moment of darkness what God has already revealed in the light. Move out of that. The enemy is coming at you like a flood, reminding you of who you used to be. Remind him of who you are now and whose you are. And others of you, Others of you need to step into the light for the first time, like a child. I don't care if you're 65, 75, 85, 95, 105. You need to step into the light as the heart and the innocence of a child. Because you have to understand something today. Healing, the healing you need is on the other side of the revealing you're willing to make. So if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you're like Nicodemus and you came here today, you kind of came out of the shadow of darkness and you've stepped into the light and you've seen this and it's exposed your heart, I want to ask you, would you just say yes to Jesus right now? Maybe you're watching online. You want to say yes to Jesus right there where you are in your car or in your living room or in this room. See, I can lead you through a prayer, but it has to be your prayer. It's a simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I'm far from you. But I come to you today with the heart of a child. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I invite you into my life to be my Savior and my Lord. Tell him, Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus was your only son. Tell him you believe Jesus died on the cross. But three days later, he arose again in victory. And now thinking for the new life that you have, the born from above life that you have, that you are now a part of the kingdom of God, moving towards an eternity in heaven with him. And for those of you that are here today and you're just dealing with doubt, listen, doubt doesn't disqualify you. But let doubt be the launching pad for a conversation with a holy God that sets you up for a spiritual transformation. As we conclude today, if you prayed that prayer of salvation, if you gave your life to Jesus, while everybody else has their heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm going to ask you if, you, if you prayed that prayer, would you look up at the screens? Because there's a word, meet Jesus, and there's a number, 94,000. Sometime today, would you just text that word to us? Here's why. Because we have a new believers class called Foundations. And we just want to invite you to it. Help you take your next step with Jesus. Listen, you started with Jesus, stay with Jesus. Learn more about him. This is a great way to start your journey. Let us know. We, we're not going to bother you. We want to help you. And for the others in this room, just continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. The Bible says if you do that, you'll have fellowship one with the other. You, you, you will step into a light, and that light will set you free. Because when you surrender, you join the winning team. And Jesus wins in the end, folks. So God, we thank you for what you've done in this room today. ask you to do it one more time at 1130. And continue to move as we move towards Easter weekend. Continue to teach us. Continue. Continue to save people's lives continue to make disciples of you. In Jesus' name I pray.
So as you leave here today, we're going to have prayer team members down front if you need prayer. Also, as you leave, stop by the info kiosk and grab some Easter invite cards. Invite some folks to come to Easter with you. Other than that, God bless you. You're dismissed.